Hey now everyone, before we get into this breakdown of the series finale of The Bad Batch, the cavalry has arrived. Spoiler warning, spoilers. Just like that, another mostly well done from top to bottom Star Wars animated series has come to a close. And while more hardcore fans of the franchise may be left feeling like the finale ignored some of the more mysterious Bad Batch plot threads, The Cavalry Arrives did indeed put a nice little bow on the adventures of Omega and her brother dads. So in terms of resolving what happened to Clone Force 99, the series finale accomplished that with a nice little gut punch of the feels in the end courtesy of the excellently crafted epilogue. Unfortunately though, at least for those fans who felt that this finale would be nothing but one big emotional wound thanks to the need to resolve the stories of the famous named clones, as in they probably should die otherwise why weren't they with Rex, Gregor, and Wolf in Rebels, but there was no clear resolution to their ultimate fates outside of clones having the freedom to choose who they want to be moving forward. It seems like a missed opportunity to finally explain to fans where Cody ended up, where Echo ended up, and what finally got Wolf to leave the Empire. Now we have to wonder what these mega heroes, who could never say no to fighting for what's right, just decided to chill out. Did they all just grow old and watch the Empire abuse the galaxies for decades on end until the Rebel Alliance could do something about it? Well, it's looking like that's the case, and I guess fans just need to accept that unless there are still stories to be told during the early rise of the Empire. But when you consider that the epilogue took the series all the way into the Age of Rebellion, it seems that the rise of the Empire era has been passed by, at least for stories featuring clones and Omega, so I wouldn't bet on any new franchises set soon after the end of The Bad Batch. Which also means that Asajj's mysterious resurrection will be relegated to books or comics, because there doesn't seem to be an angle for her and Omega training anymore, and now that this era has seemingly been fully explored, she only makes sense in material about the Path and Quinlan Voss. Hell, all the Clone X opera stuff ended up being a waste of speculative thought as well, as they ended up just being the bad Bad Batch, and nothing more. Not clone crosshair, no brainwash Cody, they were just clones who have been ultra conditioned. Again, for the purpose of just telling the story of Clone Force 99, they didn't need to be anyone special, nor did fans really need to learn the fate of every surviving clone, why there was a female clone, why Nala Se made Omega special in the first place, and a litany of other small plot threads started this season. But the bonuses for superfans would have been a great payoff for their time investment if the writers opted to make the Clone X Force a bit more narrative, narratively relative, as well as providing clear resolutions on the other Bad Batch Season 3 pro plot threads that felt like they were building to some sort of eye-opening revelation that just never panned out or got completely glossed over. Herein lies the conundrum with the series finale. On the surface, it was damn good and full of memorable Star Wars moments, complete with an emotional juggernaut to close things out. But in the end, it does feel a bit too clean, convenient, and overall lackluster thanks to how some plot threads that fans thought would be more important to pay off on got muted or just very bland resolutions. Although, I will say that the epilogue is one of the best scenes in all of Star Wars now. Girl dads, you can't deny it. And I'm thankful for how it wrecked my guts and is still getting me misty-eyed just typing about it. So while I do feel like many opportunities were missed in the Bad Batch series finale, I do also feel like it ended memorably. And with the purpose of wrapping up the main story of Clone Force 99 and the little girl they never knew they needed to make their lives feel complete. It was a beautiful end that just felt a bit too safe with more open plot threads than there should have been. Top moments time. This episode was full of great action, but I have to lead with Hunter, Crosshair, and Wrecker versus the Bad Bad Batch. You know you like their new name, come on. Anyway, this was a radical looking fight and perfectly showcased how deadly the clone axes were thanks to whatever conditioning Hemlock gave them. They truly were the Yangs to the Batch's Yins, and each operative had a specialty to mirror those of the 99 boys. The stakes felt high, and we even got a lopped off hand in true Star Wars becoming a hero fashion. So it was an intense scene to watch play out, and it did tease that the Batch was very vulnerable and ultimately extremely lucky to survive the encounter. Up next is the Rainy Bridge Showdown with Hemlock. 
We got Scorch's fate resolved, although ultimately a big nothing in the end, but at least he got got for being an Imperial punk. And more importantly, Hemlock got shot about 60 times and fell like Palpatine to his death, so that was satisfying. But the true shining aspect of this moment is Crosshair coming through after finally trusting that both Omega and Hunter believed in him and that he could do his job to complete the mission. He was then rewarded with an amazing hug first from Omega, even before she embraced her OG dad bro in Hunter. It was the full circle moment Crosshair has been working towards all season, and you could see how his time with Omega was the secret sauce in making him realize that he is loved by his family and they will always have his back and put their trust in him. Two things he thought he lost when he betrayed them two seasons ago. This was definitely the first real emotionally charged scene in this episode, and it was fantastic that Crosshair and Omega were the ones to provide it considering their season-long bonding. And the final moment is a combo of the last few shots of the show and of course that amazingly touching epilogue that somehow made all of the open Bad Badge plot threads not feel as important for a few moments. While I would have loved to learn how the Batch, Echo, Dr. Carr, and the others would pledge themselves to fighting the Empire, I did kind of appreciate Hunter's take on things. These poor clones were literally bred to fight and die, so hearing Hunter talk about how they now have the freedom to choose who they want to be makes complete sense. They've done nothing but their part and ultimately they helped to severely delay Project Necromancer, so they did really kickstart the fight against Palpatine's empire for the little guys and gals of the galaxy. But as Star Wars fans, I think we always expect our heroes to be heroes until they die, so it is still a bit jarring to think that there's a good chance that all these clones, even the Echoes, Hunters, Crosshairs, and Wreckers, just said screw it, enough is enough, I'm retiring. They did earn it, so I'll leave it at that. Then of course you have the epilogue, which has to be said at least 10 years after the Tantus event. Seeing an adult Omega was perfection, complete with her Clone Force 99 skull patch and Hunter's bandana being used in her hair. The idea that she was trying to sneak away to join the Rebels was so Omega and so what her dad bros would have done a decade or two earlier. She truly has become a strong and capable woman thanks to the love her dad showed her all of her life. Being a girl dad myself made their goodbye extremely difficult as it foreshadowed a tough moment I hope to have one day with my own daughter, and I just found it to be some of the most beautiful feeling Star Wars sadness I've ever experienced. Her journey became real to me as I projected what saying goodbye to my kid would be like in 10 more years. The epilogue was the perfect culmination of Omega's journey with the clones and how Hunter was her de facto father. I felt his pain deeply, but also experienced his pride with hope that I too can be a hunter and raise an amazing, caring, yet strong little lady. Thank you for that, Bad Batch. You may not have given us everything we wanted, but the way I feel when I reflect on the epilogue is well worth not getting all the nuanced answers my fanboy headcanon was looking for. Hey, eggs in reference time. All right. How about Echo breaking out the Havoc call signs again? Havoc 5 standing by. We also finally got a real deal Star Destroyer and learned Tarkin had command of it. It's only natural that Governor Budget Guy would get the first new toy that his accountants let the Empire buy. Speaking of the soon to be Grand Moff, he dropped a Project Stardust tease when discussing what to do with Necromancer funding. In fact, he's talking to Bragg, who is a character that first appeared in Season 1 of The Bad Batch and again in Season 2, so there's that. And I may be going out on a limb here, but outside of Omega wearing Hunter's red bandana, I'm pretty sure her ship is made out of the Marauder. It just seems like they salvaged what they could and built a nice little ship out of the wreckage. The lines are just too similar. Hey now, make sure to join us as we wrap the Bad Batch and prepare for the Acolyte over on the Star Wars Time Show. Like the video, sub, and all that other fun stuff. You can even become a member these days, so head on down below for details. There's always time for Star Wars time and stuff like that.